to the ninth meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members to, and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Tavish Scott, Richard Lockhead and Ross Greer and I would like to welcome Andy Whiteman uh, who will be substituting for Ross Greer to the meeting and invite him to declare any relevant interests. Uh, nothing to declare. Thank you very much Mr Whiteman. Our first item of business today is a decision to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Our second item of business today is the fourth evidence session in an inquiry into Scotland's screen sector and we will focus today on infrastructure. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Rosie Ellison, Film Manager at Film Edinburgh, Jim O'Donnell, Director of Development at PCL Land Limited, Tiernan Ke Kelly, Director of Film City Glasgow, David Brown, Producer LBD Outlander, and Amy Mormont, Location Manager of LS Productions. Thank you for coming to give evidence for us today. Um, I would like to begin by asking a question on um, the Film Studio Delivery Group. This is something that was set up by government uh, in 2013. Uh, you'll all be very aware and you have direct, uh, obviously very direct involvement in the whole issue of film studio uh, delivery in Scotland and it's obviously been a topic uh, of debate in Scotland for a long time and so I just wondered what, um, what your experience was, if any, of the film studio delivery group and how they have supported your sector in Scotland. Who would like to start? Yeah. I'll start. I mean, I think the film studio delivery group was started in May 2013. I think with hindsight, if you looked back now and said, if we haven't delivered anything in five years, have we done our job properly? And that's maybe the big question. But you could maybe flip that and say, have they been given the tools to deliver what they've been asked to do? I mean, because Creative Scotland are heavily involved. They don't have a capital budget to speak of, so all they can do is lobby and be advocates for a studio. Scottish Enterprise, you would argue their remit is not really to invest in speculative projects. We don't, you know, that's, they're about growth and not speculation. So, and they're to implement, not make policy. So have they been given the right tools to deliver the task? Which they, which they haven't, clearly. But is, is that maybe the inherent point there? From, from my perspective, I think it needs someone pretty senior within government to say, to green light, you know, take the recommendations and, and greenlight it because at the moment they don't really have the power to do that. Okay. Anyone else like to come in? Um, from my point of view, um, although I don't have any direct dealing with them, just my awareness of them in the industry, it seems to me that although obviously there has been some, uh, you know, a level of investment and in, in investigation into Ward Park Studios that actually from, from my point of view and I think from many people that submitted evidence that um, for us it's not about having one solution, although it's fantastic to have the facilities available at Ward Park and that's a, an excellent beginning. They know that there are, there should be multiple ventures and multiple studio spaces, whether that is adapted studio and purpose-built studios and there's room for for multiple studio spaces so from my point of view and what I've read um, although it seems that they have heavily been involved um, in the ward park development um, you know that that's not the the sort of final solution as such um, would be my addition to that. I think I should say something about that as I have uh, been responsible for ward park I guess in that sense with uh, our landlords there has been no investment uh, apart from the de minimis amounts into either Outlander or Ward Park. Ward Park has been developed completely with um, external investment, inward investment, uh, from Sony and Stars, who are the parents of the TV show. I mean, we did have some initial interaction with the uh, delivery committee who came and visited us, but from our perspective, they helped us in no way whatsoever. And uh, I think in the end, we really just had to say we'd have enough of their visits and we had to move on. No contact whatsoever with the delivery group. Um, we had one meeting with Creative Scotland three years ago, two conversations after that, and two meetings with Scottish Enterprise. 
But on all occasions, um, they would not engage with us until we had planning consent. So therefore, we have progressed with no input whatsoever from them. Thank you. We add that yes. you know wh what you're asking them to do is because if you look, you know, in, in my submission, we, I described other types of studio development in the UK and they broadly fall into maybe two or three categories. You have things like Northern Ireland, you know, with North Foreshore and Titanic, which are entirely private sector developments that are part of wider uh, strategic developments in the, that area. Uh, you, you, you've got the news this week about, say, Dagenham, and everyone's like, really excited about what Dagenham City Council are doing. But behind that, they're building 500 new houses at London prices. That's probably £150 million of development. So are you asking the Film Studio Delivery Group to become private stroke mixed development users? Because that's really only, as I see it, the type of private sector <coughs> investment in film studios in the UK at the moment. Secondly, you've got the, the other case, cases I put in terms of submission where where the Welsh Government has got on board with Pinewood and Bad Wolf Productions and has essentially bought premises and leased them back to the relevant parties. So are they going to do that? Uh, and then the third example was obviously, you know, which one we're keen to talk about later was in Manchester, where the City Council has just kind of took the reins and built everything from scratch, so or, or acquired space and refurbished development space. So uh, to me it doesn't seem that they're sort of hamstrung in a certain way. They're not allowed to do any of those those three studio projects I've just described. So, should should the government be enabling them to do that? That would be my argument. Uh, at this point, that you know, the committee is very grateful for your very interesting presentation at Film City, and also for for Mr. Brown's uh, tour of Ward Park, which mm -hmm. was also uh, very 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 enlightening as well. I'd like to zoom in on the Pentland project now because obviously you've now got the green light. I wonder if you could, could tell us a little bit, you have made a submission, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more um, about where the project is, um, what delivery times are, and, and why, why the business model is, is right uh, for, for Scotland in your view. Um, well, in summary, we have now, the deadline was yesterday for um, objectors to, the ju to raise a judicial review against the government's um, instruction to grant planning in principle. So that deadline passed yesterday, another deadline that we've had to wait for. Uh, on Monday, we started the survey work on the site, which was three days before the deadline, but we felt that it was reasonable because of programming to go on with that. And these are the surveys, these are the uh, intrusive surveys on the below ground issues that we will experience on the site. We have appointed Robertson Construction as our construction uh, preferred contractor and are working with them on their um, design development assistance with our design team and with their um, suppliers and their supply chain. The target dates that we are working to is to have the complete sound stage and workshop space available and opened by the third quarter 2019. The office space by Easter of the following year and the university building by September 2020. So when do you think it will be available for people to come in and make films? The third quarter 2019. Right, right, okay. Um, Okay, many other projects in Manchester, like such as Manchester, have, have taken a, fa a phased approach. Are, is, that the, is that the approach that you're also taking? Yeah, I mean, the, the approach is being driven by the market. It's the demand that our marketing team has identified. Um, we are confident that within the next six months, when we can convince the sector that the studio will be ready, that they will commit to actually booking the, the stages. Okay, and certainly fr from the beginning, one of the things that you, you yourself have always said about the project um, is that it's very much a private sector-led project. Uh, does that remain the case, or will you be looking for public sector Absolutely. support? Absolutely, it's a private sector-led. You see, my experience is as property developer in construction. I don't make movies. My I was invited to go and gain the experience to work at Warner's at Leavesden. So uh, having identified the opportunity that was here in Scotland, 
We've acted as developers. So therefore, we haven't engaged with, we've engaged with the AFTPS and with Rosie and all of these other people to give us more or less the evidence that developed the size and scale of the studio and the buildings that's there. Over this next two to three year period, we will create the buildings. After that, it's, it's more important about the, the sector, which is the training, the product, the crews, who will man it, where the clients are, um, how inviting it is for the people, um, the production companies to come and actually be in Scotland. That's the most important part of it. The delivery group has had 10 years to deliver a studio. Um, I'm not critical of them. I actually endorse, I agree, that partly. But from my investigations, there wasn't anyone really that had built a studio. And therefore, the grounds and criterion that they used to develop and evolve, evolve where, even to the scale of it is, wasn't apparent. The problem, one of the problems that we've seen is that Scotland over the last 15 years has, hasn't had the faith in the sector. They haven't had the faith in the sector to say that there's going to be here in five years. It's always been, it's feast and famine. We'll do very well for two or three years, and then we won't do very well. So that long range hasn't been there. It's been apparent in the fact that all of the offers to the market have been refurbished factory units. Ward Park is an exceptional job that David and his team have done. But it's a conversion of a factory. But by the way, I was the project manager. I built it when it was Isola. So I know the factory inside out. Govan Borough Halls to get Glasgow Film City. These are all make-do. There was no, to me, vision of where it was going to be. 20 years ago, one of, one of the guys that I respect most in this whole industry, Dan Dark at Warner Brothers, was in Scotland, looking at Scotland. And he came away. In fact, one of his comments to me was, as a Scotsman, went back from working there to come here, you never make it happen. Because there wasn't the appetite for it. But it was this long, it wasn't, it was the short-sightedness. And the one fit suits all is not what we're putting forward. Our studio complex should be complemented by the likes of Cumbernauld, Glasgow Film City. There should be a spread. And if, for example, government takes on and supports it by making it a welcome place, you could have two of our size of studios in Scotland. You said if government takes on and supports it, but you said a few minutes ago that you weren't I don't looking for you, government support. Yeah, but that's not supporting the construction of a studio. It's, constructing, it's the support of the sector by way of taxation, by way of making it attractive for the production companies to come and used by training the crews, all of that investment. That's what, in my opinion is, the investment should be. Okay, thank you very much. Did you want to come in there, David? Because obviously you are doing it. I think, I think it. you know, the thing about, uh, you know, a lot of what Jim says is absolutely spot on. I think the, the, the issue is that we have at the moment, we have this extraordinary growth in content demand out there, not just in Britain, not just in the US, in the world, but by virtue of the revolution in streaming. The amount of TV that is required out there is now extraordinary. It's never been like this at all. So what's happened here with, with Ward Park and with Outlander is that, first of all, driven by this demand, but also driven by a desire to be in Scotland, we've seen an enormous amount of investment into that building coming through this show, coming through Outlander. And that now has created a legacy. It is not a one-off. The partnership that we've created with our landlord will go on and move and create another one of these studios that, 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 that Jim is talking about. It is an issue here, guys, of political will. I don't see, the evidence is here. You've had it all from everybody else, from various parties across the board, coming through various meetings, various paperwork. There's no question that the Outlander effect has worked. Look at our impact on tourism. We're employing 250 people 10 months a year. We train 20 people a year. We're putting and delivering for you. If you attract more of these shows, the, the knock-on effect is incremental. And at the moment, the issue of someone like Dan Dark coming up, as Jim was mentioning, saying it can't work, is about, we have to look at ourselves as being an offshoot, uh, inevitably, unfortunately, from the main centre, which is London. 
The political will is about shifting that gear, changing that perspective and saying, yes, we want to, as a nation and as a country, build that, build that industry. And it's our choice. You can let it continue as a kind of a victim industry that's always got its hands out, always saying we need more, we need special breaks. Or you can shift the gear and attract businesses like Outlander. If you have two or three Outlanders a year, the amount of inward investment is staggering. It's not just, but it's not just about the building. The building has been an annoying, frustrating, tedious thing. I was on committees 20 years ago talking about a studio in, in Scotland, and it just ain't coming about. It has to be about you in government saying, no, we want to change it. We want an industry. We don't want it to be an offshoot from London. We don't want our people and our best of our creatives going to London and being sucked into the Indian national industry. We as a nation see it's important. We want to build the infrastructure, build the training, build the industry, encourage entrepreneurial producers, and shift the gear. Because Jim's building, with that enormous investment, requires a huge amount of, a huge amount of product to come in and pay for it. Wall Park, the building is paid for. Sony have invested it. So Wall Park will always pick up business. But Jim's building, in my opinion, needs that kind of instrumental push coming from government and the government agencies, well-funded, out there in the world saying, we will get you into Scotland. We will bribe you into Scotland in the same way that Northern Ireland did. Northern Ireland made a positive decision to say, we will build an industry. And they attacked it on all areas, training, infrastructure, reputation, marketing, to bring people in. When I started Outlander, all I said was to the agencies in Scotland, I want you to match Northern Ireland. I want you to prove to Sony and the studios in the States that we are open for business and that we will do what it takes to bring, bring companies in and bring this kind of $300, $400 million investments into, the Scot into Scotland. Nobody did anything about it. For, it promises turn to frustration, turn to actually annoyance and irritation. I won't have them in the building now because I don't have the time for it and I don't see them actually in any way adding to the business or my business. So it's just that. It's just like, you know, make a decision because we've been talking about it for too long. If it isn't a game that the government wants to be in, let us get on with our jobs. Okay, thanks very much. I should say that the committee is not government. The committee is a cross-party cross committee. And, uh, I, we, and I, I do appreciate but that. But we do scrutinise government as a result of our evidence well, I, gathering. I guess what I'm saying is yeah. it's up to you to scrutinise government and perhaps <laughs> tell them that now is the time. But the only way government should really be involved is in gap funding, when there is a shortfall. Now, in our particular business case, there is no shortfall. So, therefore, we would not merit involvement from the government. And we made that very clear at the outset. There was no dependency. Personally, I'm tired of people holding their hand out to government and expecting government to pay for them to perpetuate it. Allow the market to decide. Rosie. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say also that another thing that Outlander has done is uh, raise the profile of Scotland internationally amongst the film community. We've had more high-value inquiries from international productions than we ever used to in the past. Um, filmmakers who've seen Outlander or have heard about Outlander and now recognise that Scotland can accommodate that level of production, which we haven't been able to in the past. Unfortunately, of course, we still don't have a facility to put them in at this point, but it's great news to hear that um, the survey has started on Pentlands. Let's hope that, that that fills the timetable. We can start planning ahead and hopefully get some big projects booked in to that, because the business is definitely there. People do want to come here. They're recognising that we have more crews here. We will, of course, need a lot more. And you've pointed out the training requirements. But also good news that the NFTS is set up in um, an out uh, a branch in Scotland now, in Glasgow. I think that opens its doors uh, in April, so next week, I imagine, um, uh, which will lead to a lot more trained uh, craftspeople, skilled workforce, we're going to, you know, when the studio at Pentlands is open, there's an academy there, which I hope will train more skilled workforce as well. There's, there's a high demand for that, and that is very much something that the government, the public sector, can, can work to support. 
Now, we have a, a few members that are specifically interested in asking uh, supplementary questions about the Pentland studio. So I'll take some quick supplementaries on that, but I'm not taking them unless they're about the Pentland studio. So, um, Jackson, Carlo. I should say, Kavir and I have been an advocate for the Pentland position. I'm an enthusiast about it, and actually I've really been more excited than I am at the moment at the prospect that is coming about, really in spite of the establishment rather than because of the establishment, if I can put it that way. Um, I'm very, I, I see the detailed uh, sort of submitted plan that you now have got. I mean, the first thing I remar I'm noting is it's for a film studio's. Because, of course, uh, there were lots of people who advocated that the minute there was a planning consent, what we were going to get was a housing development and not a film studio. So I'm very pleased to see that they've all been proved wrong. But you've got quite an ambitious timescale for this. Um, uh, you would have the whole project complete before Network Rail will have the new Glasgow Queen Street station building put up. And they started construction 18 <laughs> months ago. So, uh, I mean, are you confident about the timescale uh, for all of that? Because it's, it's a lot to have in place by 2020, Jim. <clears throat> these are not complicated buildings. The statements of architecture are basically in the academy and on the, um, the reception, the main administration building. The rest of them are not complicated whatsoever. They're repetitive. And we are confident, yes, that the supply chain is there. What's a water studio at one? Is that, is that gone in the plans now? There was a, a water stage There's in There's a the... water stage. Yeah. Um, it, it may come back. It may come back. Can I ask specifically about the academy? Because one of the things I felt um, when we visited Ward Park, and I fully expect David Brown, given that he's giving evidence today, to give us all the spoilers for the next season and uh, his evidence, but was the way in which crafts had been built up on site. There was the carpentry department, there was the wardrobe department, there was the uh, whole decorating department. Um, clearly, the intention of the academy is with all the production that's coming and we've heard about, you know, we're only at the beginning of the streaming revolution, there could be even more content coming from all new streamers we don't know about yet. The Film Academy is designed to create opportunities for people in that sector to be employed, but I take it that will take time to come through. Uh, what was interesting was the number of Scots that were actually being employed at Ward Park in the production of Outlander at every level. Um, initially, how do you see the uh, film studio actually bringing in talent that, it can, that can be deployed from day one, or is that something that you think will, will build up, or, or are the skills there initially to actually satisfy the kind of filmmaking demand that you will be, that you will be satisfying? Hopefully there's going to be a repatriation of expat Scots that are working in Ireland, working in England, Australia, New Zealand. We have 84 people that have contacted us asking to be updated and who are fairly highly respected as technicians in the industry. Um, On-job training is one of the most important things. As far as the dealing with the, the academy, the academy, first of all, was a real estate and profit-driven idea. We looked at the marketplace, the world marketplace, to say, where is there a hook? So where, where could we find a university that was adjacent to a film studio? There wasn't one. So that was our first incentive. So it was driven by the profit and the real estate side. We approached Edinburgh and Apia University because they had been identified as the Scottish Film Academy. We'd been working with Edinburgh and Apia University uh, to evolve the scale of the academy that's there, to fit into their estates, to fit into their uh, curriculum. Uh, I can identify one in particular. We are working with them to have a degree in special effects. There isn't one in the UK. And what there will be is, uh, if they can develop that, that would then bring in the students, the training. Um, really, it's a, it's a very, very broad base, the understanding of the training and the, uh, the requirements for the crews. Once the studio is built, Crews will be required. The majority of these crews will be imported. They may even be stolen from, David, from what's happened there. But that's, that's what the market will be. Um, Can I ask you one? Mm -hmm. A brief supplementary. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, David Brown has identified, and which uh, Visit Scotland have now 
you know, put together a whole tour program around the locations of Outland. There is the huge consequential boost to sectors well out with the film and television sector in Scotland, tourism essentially, particularly coming from seven year television uh, series cycles of some of these international productions as opposed to individual movies. I noticed the film studio also has a film studio tours facility. I mean, do you see the um, establishment of this film studios here as potentially also initiating um, a whole potential uh, tourist opportunity on the back of the productions that potentially uh, find their home here, in the same way they have uh, with Warner Brothers elsewhere? Um, there is the potential for that. But if you look at Warner Brothers at Leavesden, the Warner Brothers visitor attraction is the Harry Potter. I mean, Leavesden was built on Potter. Um, Pinewood has a very limited visitor uh, regime that goes there. And that's been built on Bond uh, and is about to be completely rebuilt on Disney. Uh, I don't think that we will have a strong visitor attraction aspect of our studio because of the operational side, the security side. Um, it's going to be more that we would have to really consider that in detail. It's not part of our plan just now as to have a lot of tourists going through what is um, a factory. Scotland could benefit from oh, the benefit. location work associated with the productions that are being filmed well, we have, in and around, as well as in the studio itself. Well, we also have um, an agreement with the Aberkearney estate in Persia, um, um, where we will be pushing that estate to, uh, to provide different sets, different scenes, different um, opportunities for production. So it's not just about where we are in, in, uh, in Pentland. OK, well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Whiteman, did you have specific questions about Pentland? Yes, thanks yes. very much, uh, Convener. Uh, you say that you want the soundstage to be open autumn 2019, but the, the master plan here talks about a 64-week build and a 40-week handover, which means you needed to have started last September design and we have started that yes the construction on site periods are um being negotiated with our contractor at the present time and that's robertson construction okay and to be clear psl land limited you're a developer you're the developers yes so you don't own the land we will own the land and we will own the studio so what, when are you going to acquire the land um as soon as we have vacant possession and what's what's stopping that at the present time, uh, as you are very much aware, Mr Whiteman, it's the small holding farmer who is in the land court agreeing with the Gibson estate and the compensation for the vacant possession of the site. And do you have any sense of how long a land court, potentially court of session, Supreme Court case on eviction might take? Um, we've been advised it's this June that the decision will be taken. But you may not be aware that adjudication and mediation with the small holding farmer uh, has been completed. Fine, but no eviction notice has been yet served? No. Um, where's the money coming from to build these studios? That's confidential. We are quite prepared to advise where our funding will come from as part of our detailed planning application. That's always been the agreement with Midlothian Council. And um, if the statutory smallholder uh, decides to uh, defend himself in the court of session and ultimately in the Supreme Court. Um, that could take two or three years. That's his choice. Are you, you still in the game for building the studio in those circumstances? Do you think that after the last four years, if I knew there was a better site, that I would be sitting here waiting to go through the process that we've went through? Four years it's taken us to get to this stage. This is the best site for the studio in Scotland. Why is it the best site for a studio in Scotland? There are many, many criteria. The selection criteria that we use to identify. Um, does the committee want me to spend the time and go through and explain no, it all? Just, to, just very briefly, why, why did you PSL land limits? And I'm a bit confused about the various organisations involved here. I've got an advert that was on the Edinburgh Council investment website from Pentland Studios Limited advertising a... Yeah, they group. The operational group. Pentland Studios will operate the studio. PSL Land will develop and own the studio. Okay. So this is for a hotel for practical completion in late 2017. 
Obviously, that, that's been... It's, it's now passed. If you look at the documents in front of you, you'll yeah. see that they've been evolved and developed to suit the studio. The condition of the planning consent has always been that the studio has to be finished and complete before any of the other parts of the development can take place. There is no residential. There is no retail. This is a film studio. We have two sites, site A and site B. So therefore, the delivery dates and the focus is on the studio and the academy. Thank you. Could I, could I just ask about yes. the... I, I would have to... We're really 100% behind your project, Jim, but I would have to disagree with the, the comment about letting the market decide. I mean, that's maybe a philosophical, you know, question, because no one's built a studio in Scotland proper, you know, since, since we've been involved in it and mm -hmm. going back forever. And, and using terms like having their hand out, I don't, I guess, perpetuates a myth of, you know, the creative industries always having their hand out. I think, they're, I think as Manchester's demonstrated, there is a place for you know, public sector intervention. You know, totally egalitarian, run by the public sector. All the money goes back into developing out more and more studios. So uh, I, think, I think there's a place for both, maybe. Yeah. Okay, well, in Manchester, they spent 40 million pounds in developing 135,000 square foot studios and ancillary space. Manchester, yeah. prob pro probably, I don't have that agreed to those assessed, but they're probably equipped, they're probably the right people in place, whereas Scotland doesn't. Okay, well, that's, but that's a, yeah. That's Scotland, Scotland doesn't, doesn't have okay. the people in right. place. Okay. If, if the appropriate people were in place, mm. you would have done it mm. 10 years ago. Yeah. So just to clarify, I think there is a place for, for the public sector in this. Okay, thank you very much, Mr Kelly. I think Claire Baker wants to ask you uh, more about that. Um, thank you, convener. That's a helpful introduction to the questions I have around the screen unit. Um, the convener asked about the film studio delivery group. What I'd like to move on in, is to the screen unit, which is due to be established on the 1st of April, and as I understand it will launch in the summer. Um, their uh, proposal states that a business case and new studio capacity will be secured within 12 months. So there's kind of three issues around that I'd want to raise. Uh, the first is around capacity, how the panel see the additional capacity, what the requirement for that is. I know that Amy has described the need for a kind of variety and we have the Pentland studio possibly coming down the line in a few years. Where does the role of the screen unit and their additional capacity fit in? Um, also, the, the business case. Um, Tiernan talked about different funding models. You mentioned Dagenham, you mentioned Manchester. What do you think the screen unit's business case should look like? And do people think the 12 month timescale is an achievable time scale. Well, I'm not exactly clear where the 12 months starts, given we've got a first date, first of April and not a launch till the summer. So, but I suppose we're looking at the next eight, maybe 18 months, but 12 is what they say. The, the point that I was trying to make earlier was that, you know, as I was saying, the, the film studio delivery group seemed to think that there was a, a one solution and that once we had one studio, um, you know, for example, a lot of people do talk about having Ward Park. Of course we do, and it's brilliant, and it's great to have it, and it will leave a legacy for the future. But when there's a production in it, it's not available for other productions. So what we would encourage is a variety of spaces. Obviously, the Pentland Studios is going to be a fantastic asset to Scotland. But for me as well, and for the various different levels of production, obviously high-end TV drama, high-end film is a is a excellent goal to have, and I would welcome as many high-end dramas and TV um, films coming to shoot in Scotland as possible. But there are always a variety of productions looking for studio space, um, whether that's sort of more mid-level features, um, lower budget features. Obviously, I myself work a lot in advertising. We're always looking for studio space. There's a, a wide variety of productions out there looking for studio space at various sizes, um, you know, uh, various different finishes. Some people do have investment to make to, to get that studio studio space up to scratch and obviously that is brilliant but there are some productions that do just want to walk into spaces that have already had that level of work completed that have the production office space that have the parking that have the facilities that they're looking for so they can just just come in and, and get the job done effectively so and that's what the role of the screen unit is to provide a more kind of all singing all dancing facility rather than we did have examples of um, sent to us 
of the kind of facilities that are on offer at the moment, they do tend to be warehouses. There seems to be quite a, you know, you'd have to take quite a lot of facilities in when you go to production there. So do you see the screen units providing something that is more comprehensive? Um, I don't think I see them as exclusively yeah. providing something like that personally. I, I think I see them as having an overarching view of, of the wide ranging that spaces that are available. Obviously, if there is the option to have um, a space that is, is funded and developed by the, the government or the councils we've seen in Manchester, that would be excellent. I'd be keen to hear more about that. But I think my point about the screen unit would be is that they need to have a, a view over lots of different spaces that could be available, whether that is spaces that are privately invested or warehouse spaces that, are, that have owners or landlords that are keen to work with production companies to uh, you know, effectively done what has been done on Outlander and turn them into creative hubs for production. Because as well as, obviously, again, there are some spaces that maybe are just purely studio spaces, but it is also about, I think, for me, making these sort of creative hubs um, in, within Scotland that have the, the facilities, the training programmes and the studio space um, in, in a sort of a hub of creativity, if you like, to really drive the industry forward because it's all good and well having the spaces, but if we don't have the training and the real high level of crew in place that are willing to stay in Scotland, that have the work to keep their career going in Scotland and also the, the facilities, then, then it, what we're trying to do won't work, in my opinion. So what you have to do is have an appropriately funded film fund. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not just about a box, and I think we've got to be very wary that it is about just a box, you know. And, and you know, if, if you know, the Outlander situation is, you know, it, it, it's lovely that Scotland's embraced it, but we've got to be clear, it's not, it's not part of Scotland now. It doesn't belong to Scotland. You know, Sony have taken that building, and by virtue of its a need to produce this show, have made it into what it is. But they could move out. Fortunately, we've got a landlord that will, will now take that on as a legacy and is reinvesting the rent back into the building. But unless there is a coherent strategy which takes on board this need for crew, and I think you know, Jim's point earlier about poaching, stealing, grabbing crew is, is well made. I mean, we, we do have a higher attention of our crew. But we are having to go to the U to go to um, not simply uh, the rest of the UK to get crew, but we we brought in electricians from Hungary, we brought in art directors from the US. You know, I've got people from New Zealand, and it is about also having a strategy which realizes, and the screen unit should be responsible for this. I do feel that that is feeding that need for a crew. Is, is registering that and putting much more money into training and more, more prescribed and more, more defined training. Now, and I know that that is on the agenda. And then the other side of it is about marketing. So the three things go together because Scotland will never be happy. I know enough about the film magazine in Scotland to know they will never be happy with a box. I mean, they're not happy with Outlander. We're successful, we've got a box that's full and everybody's complaining about it, <laughs> you know. And so the issue of success, you know, how do you, you've just got to keep on growing it, but it has to be balanced and it has to be directed. And being very well aware of what's going on with the, with the industry and that there is this incessant demand at the moment for content and that, that we need a screen unit to actually grab that demand and turn it and focus it to Scotland. At the moment, Scotland is just the location of Outlander and Bray. You know, it's not a hub for filmmaking. Yeah. It's not Budapest. It's not Prague. It's not Cape Town, it's not London. Now, that again is when I was talking earlier, that notion of a political will and changing that perspective. But it's not just about a box. And I think the clamour for the box and all the controversy around it uh, is one that's maybe distracting us slightly from, from the main goal. Um, I'd like to hear from yeah, Tiernan yeah, about the business case. This goes back to the question of the tools. You know, I mean, Create Scotland, you know, the new screen unit, they can lobby, they can advocate for a studio, but they, won't, they don't have the funding to do it. They don't have the OK from, I guess, from Scottish Government to proceed with. I mean, I'll give you an example. We looked at uh, the, the Palamas building in Leith, 160,000 square feet. You know, we uh, got quite far down the line with it. We even registered the name Film City Edinburgh as a, trade, as a limited company. Uh, we brought on uh, what we thought were really good design consultants, came up with a plan. But... Create Scotland really excited about it, but the, the old issue of state aid, you know, reared its head again. And this is, you know, 
the philosophical difference about should the market decide or not. But you know, we're talking we're talking sums of 180,000 that stopped us moving forward with that project. Other people might raise questions more specifically around state aid, but mm. do you think um, the, the government have looked in more detail? Because as you provided before examples where it could be argued that state aid has been employed, whether it's been Manchester or other European cities. Why do you think in Scotland we have... Do you think we've been cautious around that, and is that caution justified? Uh, I mean, I was thinking about what would happen after this session. You'll write, you'll write to the film studio delivery group or, or the Scottish government and ask... You know, why can't we do what Manchester's doing? And they'll say, well, our, our solicitor of, solicitors of advisors due to state aid, we can't do it. Uh, well, you then push back and say, well, Manchester have done it. And they'll say, we can't really comment on other local authorities, legal the legality of their thing. But it's, I mean, it's clear from the evidence that I put forward that Manchester, through acquiring and developing and building from scratch, have created over 135,000 square foot of a ladder of accommodation, what Amy was talking about, from 1,000 square foot green screens all the way up to a brand new state-of-the-art 12 metre high 30,000 square foot stage. How have they done that? Why, why can't we probe that a bit further rather than it just, you know, my submission as a PDF sitting on a, a server somewhere, nothing, nothing getting done about it? You know, this needs, this needs a, 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 this is back to political will. I need a champion. And I, 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 I was going to say, I, you know, I had the same argument delivered to me five years ago when mm -hmm. we were, when we, when we were setting up Outlander and trying to, to pull uh, Woolpark together. It was the same position, the same, we, we are frustrated by this. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that. And, I, and if we want to move forward, we have to break through it. We have to find a way. Look, what's, in, in terms, I also mentioned what's happening in Wales. Now, the Welsh Government have essentially bought premises and leased it back to Bad Wolf Productions. Bad Wolf are about to start filming the Philip Pullman books. £7 million per episode. And Bad Wolf will say, well, of course we can rent, we can lease a space for 10 years, no problem. There we go. That could have happened with Outlander, you know, brilliant yep. Outlander, eight series. We'll buy the building and we'll rent it back yep. to you. We'll do it up. It, it is a, you know, it's, so, a, it's a crying shame, the so opportunity. Why, why didn't yes. anyone do that? You know, why didn't, you know, Script of Scotland don't have the money to do it, so... Do you and think the, sorry, just to add, do you yeah. think the screen unit will make any difference to this? So you're pointing to previous examples and there could have been, the government could have taken a different model or we could have looked at, do you think the screen unit will no, change it, it won't because, you know, you look at the, the head of the Screen Commission who, whose job it is to sell Scotland interna internationally. Her, her job should be selling Scotland internationally. Probably most of her time now is trying to get some sort of facility off the ground and it's a kind shame. And... I think, you know, her, her job remit's exactly the same regardless of, of where she is now and where she transitions into the screen unit. But she doesn't have access to the money to, 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 to do what we just talked about, buy a facility, you know, invest in a facility. And I think, you know, for the avoidance of doubt, I think you could build a 200,000 square foot refurb in Edinburgh, a 200,000 square foot in Glasgow. You could have Jim's project, you could have Film City, and they would all be full. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's the number of it. There's no, there's no it's, sense. Well, I would say there, are, yeah. there mm -hmm. uh, if I may, there there would be full as long as that screen unit actually comes changes its perspective a little bit, and 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 not not continues the practice it has done for the last 20, 30 years in its various formats, and actually says our remit is something else now. Our remit is to really sell Scotland, is to bring into international uh, 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 productions. Our our game is to bring in inward investment. And once that happens, there, is, there will be a tipping point, if, if it is, goes forward, whereby these facilities are put forward, the training happens, and indigenous production and that indigenous creativity can happen and gets triggered off by that. But it, it's about reaching, reaching for something which I don't think anybody's really reached for yet. I mean, you know, again, when, when Creative Scotland turned around to me, as a producer, said, you've got to send an email or write to, write to Parliament to get them to put the pressure on them to give us more funding or give us more facility or give us more leeway in terms of our development. I, I, I think it's indicative of a situation where the, 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 uh, those bodies are really frustrated in their, in, their, in their goals and their tasks and they're not really equipped to, to progress the industry in the way that we see as, as practitioners, and I think the evidence is out there internationally, that there is the potential for, the, for that. And again, as I said before, I'm not going to go on it once more. We're just once more. You know, it's that political will thing. Do we want it or not? Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Yeah, the, the panel, I suppose, just want one other question about the screen unit. The panel are all very busy people, so I appreciate if you've not um, been scrutinising the screen unit proposals as, as they've been coming along. Um, we had a panel of the partner organisations before us a few weeks ago, which included Scottish Enterprise, Creative Scotland, uh, Skills Development Scotland, and there's one other partner who's... And Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, and the committee questioned, we, we did have some concerns about the ability of the screen unit to be uh, responsive enough, to be flexible enough, to be able to make decisions quick enough. Um, I don't know how, um, you did mention what the remit of the screen unit should look like. I don't know if the panel have any further questions on the screen unit going forward. Yeah, delivering something in a year, and I, uh, and I, I felt at the time that, that was said that that was somewhat unrealistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot see... Maybe just a concept rather than a... Perhaps yeah, so, yeah, a concept, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, I mean, uh, uh, screening, you need, I think it just needs to be beefed up. It needs to, it needs, its remit needs to be thoroughly examined, and its, uh, its, its end goal needs to be questioned. No. There's one final question, because some of the members talked about um, they felt that government or Scottish Enterprise hadn't en engaged enough, and I suppose the question is about the role of intervention, where you, what you see the role of government in trying to grow the Scottish industry. What the Screen Unit has a commitment to um, work with to encourage private sector-led development into studio infrastructure. From the evidence we've heard from the panel, it seems like that's not been happening so far. Do you think that should be their focus? I know others have talked about actually the focus is about developing the sector roundabout, so it's about skills, it's about um, the attractiveness of coming here, and where does financial incentives and levers play into that? So I suppose the, where, what do you think the role of government going forward really should, what the focus should be going forward? Blatant support. It shouldn't be to take control. It should be... Ga uh, in dealing with Scottish Enterprise as a property developer, Scottish Enterprise are more than capable of dealing once they know the parameters they have to deal with them. Now, they will fill a gap. But if your business case is robust enough that says that you don't merit state aid, you shouldn't receive it. That's the facts. Now, unless you change those parameters that Scottish Enterprise have to work under, then they cannot respond to the sector. This is what Tiernan's saying. They, they, they're, they're operating rules that don't apply to the game that they're in. And that's the problem, that's one of the main problems with it. Secondly, they don't have the right people in place. They don't have people in place that understand the sector and can communicate with the sector. Creative Scotland should be, in my opinion, on the aspects of the creativity. They should not be involved in buildings and utilities and creating facilities. That should actually be left to Scottish Enterprise. That's what they're good at, or they profess to be good at. I'd like to put a different, a different, slightly different take on that, which is that I think that, that in the particular case of Scotland, it, I think Jim's Jim's argument is well taken and well made in environments such as London, where there is a, you know, a consistent history of you know a multiple number of studios and in excess of eighty or ninety stages in the, in the, in that building in in that area, if you like. The situation in Scotland, I think, is somewhat different. And the development of the screen sector in all its aspects is, is what is required if we want that industry to grow. And involvement in, in investment in buildings, involvement in investment in training and into marketing and to encouraging inward investment and indigenous productions is, to me, the, a wider remit that that screen unit should be responsible for. And, it's, and, and it's not... It's not simply a matter of buildings, or, or, but I do think it needs to happen. It should happen. It should help. Because we do have a, you know, the, the, our geographical and economic environment is susceptible to talent drain, to concept drain, to intellectual property drain, all those things leaving Scotland. And so we have to kind of fight, or we have to have strategy in order to pull that back in and to let that grow. And that is, I mean, obviously, in our opinion, it, is, it feels to be that it's something that we want to do and it's worth doing because I, and I don't think that the economic, the economic, the numbers say that. They tell us it's worth it. You know? Smith said in his presentation that, for example, the Netflix of the world, offering Netflix £100,000 an incentive to come to Scotland is peanuts, but it is there, it's incentive. That is what will trigger these major productions coming to Scotland. 
The yeah. facilities are required and will be required to be there. The, but they have to be made welcome, these production companies, to come here. And that is a business. They're a very strong... Tommy Gornley set up as well. Tommy Gornley said he, he, he gets up in the morning, within 15 minutes, he either drives to Leavesden or he drives to Pinewood. And he works in professional studios of a scale that allows him to do his job. That has to be created. That will be created. And there has to be a, a, a broader base of offer to these companies to get them there. The, the, the Golden Triangle in London is going to be very, very difficult to unravel. So therefore, the target that Scotland should be going, going back again to guys like Ian Smith is saying, is that um, why are companies in the UK going to Budapest? They should be coming to Scotland. So make it attractive for them to come to Scotland. And the attractiveness is in the business case. Give the film fund, or create a film fund of 20 million plus, and then arm the people in that film fund, people like Rosie, to provide the incentives to get them here and to stay here. We need pre and post production. You know, not just um, the short lived year hire of a sound stage in Pentlands. That has to be sustained. Other members in, and Rachel Hamilton. Good morning, panel. I'd like to ask uh, Tainan in particular how um, he thinks that Manchester managed to circumvent the state aid rules. Uh, Personally, I think they did it because their, their, their very strategic vision of... They stated that they wanted Manchester to be Europe's leading digital city by 2020, and they wrapped the whole of the creative industries and their digital presence around that statement. And they acquired the, the Sharp Electronics building, built the Sharp project. They clustered digital companies, tech companies, film and TV companies, and probably through serendipity, they had old warehouses at the back that lent themselves to film and television use. On the success of that, they developed the Space Studios, which again took over the Fujitsu Siemens factory in another part of Manchester. And this is all within a two mile radius of Manchester city centre. Uh, built 55,000 square foot of studios. That was a success. And then they've built, not, a refurb, not as a refurb, from scratch, as I mentioned earlier, a brand new 30,000 square foot studio. Plus the vault. Stage, vo not studio. St stage, 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 yeah, yeah, it's, it's stage. Uh, plus they've also acquired uh, uh, another 80,000 square foot property that is sp specific for creative and digital tech. And all those companies fall under a company called Manchester Creative Digital Assets Limited, which is 100% owned by Manchester City Council. So it's acquiring sites and it's building brand new, new buildings all framed around, no, no one there was talking about we're building film studios, we're building TV studios. There was a much more sense of what the creative industries can add to the city's economy. Uh, I mean, one interesting stat, if you look at the recent D DCMS figures show that between 2010 and 2016, Scotland had the highest growth in the creative industries. And we're going to tie that to a report that Oldsberg did and said that film and TV is the greatest contributor to the creative industries. Uh, so if you tie those things together, we are the fastest growing sector, uh, nation, region in, in, in the UK for creative industries. Film and TV is driving that. You know, why, why can't we bring those two together? By 2025, there's going to be more creative jobs than STEM jobs. You know, it's, it's clear that they've... they've They've grasped that creative industries concept and ran with it. So it's not where I think in Scotland we've been so tired to this concept of a film studio and maybe the state aid. Uh, and, and probably by stealth as well. I mean, Pine, the likes of Pinewood and other studios haven't really complained about Sharp Project because, or the Sharp and Space because it's what we try to do at Pacific Key and it's in iterations, small iterations. They've now built up 135,000 square foot of studio space across three sites. I mean, I, I don't know what, what the, the, the answer in terms of pure legislation. Um, you, you've led quite nicely to the next question I had uh, broadly for the panel, which was about the statement that Manchester uh, City Council made about being a global um, digital city by 2020. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel, um, uh, because David Brown, when we visited the Outland at the Ward Park Studios, um, had said that the local council had been incredibly supportive. And I wondered uh, 
what role you felt that the, the local council, the regional authorities have within uh, delivering um, the, the screen sector ambitions. The, the local council was supportive yeah. in everything but material. Mm -hmm. So they voiced support. There was, need, there was no financial support okay. in any way. Okay, so just, just clear to... Just okay, to and on. so building on that, um, you know, the other models throughout Europe have been successful because of the council uh, obligation and uh, they met with land and assets as well. So c can we have a discussion about that? In my submission, I said this... this there's, there's two elements to it, you know. You have, a, you have a central government who's the majority government in the big two cities, Glasgow and Edinburgh. In my opinion, it should be the, the government who is enabling those lo local authorities to do so. And do you know what? We live in uncertain times. We've got Brexit, we've got austerity, etc. And if the local authorities don't have the money to do that, that's good. But what really frustrates me at the moment is that everyone in the public sector is hiding behind this, this state aid issue when it's, it's not. So it's either an economic one and we can't afford to do it, and that's fine. But if it's a legislative one, uh, we need to dig a bit deeper. I don't think it's a legis legislative one. I think it may be any kind no, of one. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think it's been used an excuse myself. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's our perception of it. And, and I, I don't think there's enough evidence elsewhere around, around Europe, and as, as Tuna brings in Manchester, to suggest that if you, if you want to get around it, you'll find a way. Yeah. You'll find a way. And, and uh, so it's back into that a rather quaint phrase of political. And that, remember, that sits alongside Salford and the BBC and all the pie factory and all these, you know, commercial developments down at Salford. There's an ecosystem there now in I mean, terms of offer. Look at what we're missing. You know, we're missing that. We're at this time of growth in streaming, of investment from Sony just on one show of $400 million, we're missing it. We could have three of them, four of them. So I think those questions had to be asked in terms of a strategy about the film unit, about what is it, you know, where, where does it really want to go? Is it, has it got that, that ambition to build this sector in all areas, not just film and TV, whatever they may be, all the creative sectors? And I think that's worth, that really is the question. And, and what's standing in the way? And to me, I, uh, personally, I think that when you read around the subject and you, you look at a lot of the different companies involved, obviously there, there are, as you were saying, you had the, the panel of them here not long ago, there are a lot of companies involved in a lot of different elements of the industry, whether it is training or funding, um, whatever it might be. And I think for me, the, the most important thing for the screen unit would be accountability and an overarching view of, of all of those things and an organisation that you know, no matter what other organisations are involved, has a view of everything that's going on, everything that's available to people that live and work in Scotland, to produ incoming productions, to indigenous productions, so that they can actually have a, a really good view of, of what is available to people and, and pushing that industry forward. Because at the moment, I know as, as someone who lives and works here, I often it is slightly confusing for me about who do you go to for for what element of, of what you require and I think if you have a screen unit that that have the time that have the accountability and have the funding to to really progress the industry forward here because not only are we looking at catching up with other areas of the UK with Northern Ireland Wales with certain areas of England we actually now we're at a point where not only do we need to catch up with them, but we need to really a a establish ourselves as of something different and try and surpass them as well, because I agree with a lot of the panel here, as, as fantastic it is to have studio spaces, it's not just about that, it's about everything else that, that comes along with it to really establish Scotland as this amazing creative hub to come and bring your production that's producing indigenous content, um, international productions, and I think that it's quite clear at the moment that it's, it's missing an organisation that is, is solely accountable for driving that, I would say. Um, if we look at Bristol and Liverpool, um, but well, Bristol now has the uh, bottle yard, which um, local authority was very supportive about the development of that, but it was owned by the council. So they were in a position to be able to make that offer to the production community and get that off the ground. Um, Liverpool at the moment is in the process of developing its own film studio in, the, in um, what was the Littlewoods factory. But again, the council owned the land. I think that's a crucial difference yeah, up here. The slight difference with Liverpool, I think this is what any local authority in the UK would, would, would have done. You know, 
the, the, the private developer, Capitan Centric, have came in and said, do you know what, if you buy that land for us, we'll develop out 250,000 square foot of space. Well, they own the land already, so they... Uh, yeah, so well, the, the count, I think yeah. the council bought the land for one, for one point a million and said, there you go, developing that, jobs, economy, GVA, brilliant. It's a no-brainer. Any local authority in the UK would do that. and develop, you know, It's like Dagenham, do you know, of course. They've bought the land in Dagenham and said, there you go, they're building a studio, they're building 500 houses, a travel lodge, a Costa Coffee. You know, any lo I mean, and it's the five hundred houses, the travel lodge that's paying for the studio. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so, so I think not, you know, it's the, this is not rocket science. Yeah, mm -hmm. and what you're doing is you're you're, you're going into areas which, um, um, the Crover. To answer the question, three years to get through planning, eighteen months to get through Parliament uh, to the government for a planning consent. That shows you how much we've went through to try to get to the position that we're in just now. So no, we did not receive what we felt was appropriate support where everyone else said it was a good enough project. And um, that's just a fact. Could it have been made better? Yes. It could have been streamlined. It could have been looked at. Um, but we still have to work with Midlothian Council. We still have to now do the detail. What people should realise is this studio is going to be there for the next 25 to 30 years. It's not just a refurbished factory unit that will go back to being a factory unit if they don't get a production. What's wrong with our refurbished factory unit? <laughs> and it's, I mean, it, and it's, it's case and form, it, it is it, it, absolutely it. excellent at, for what it's doing. But um, if your landlord decides, if your landlord decides that, you know what, I've made enough money and I'm going to actually turn it back into what I originally bought it for, then that would close. Now, common sense would say, having Sony invested probably £7 million to get it there, that the legacy that they're leaving there, the guys had a fantastic leg up to continue as a studio, and so he should. There are many, there must be different offers other than just Pentland. But, but the, the incentive, the incentive, uh, and I think, there's the elephant in the room. These councils broke the rules. Scottish Enterprise were not prepared, and are still not prepared, to bend the rules. The Welsh broke the rules, the Irish broke the rules. Go and speak to your own people in Scottish Enterprise and give them the support. Where would you say that Ireland broke the rules? Where would I say they broke the rules? Yeah, in exactly the same way as you've just described that Manchester did. But they bought, they mispresented it. They mispresented it as being an IT hub, uh, a media hub. Such big descriptions. It was a Trojan horse. It was a film studio. It was always going to be a film studio. But they bent the rules. And they were brazen enough to do it. And now what happens is that people come along and say, well, look what Ireland's done. And they'll say, so sue me. We've got the jobs, we've got the creation. You're Scotland has never done it. I'm not talking about Titanic, I'm talking about any, in the, in the studios and anything else. Scotland should have had all of these big shows. You know, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid the fact that the people that were in the groups that you have been representing and talking about have failed. They have summarily failed in actually representing and getting it there and delivering it for Scotland. And I agree with you, they feel because they may not have the right tools. They might not even be the right people to use the right tools. Mm -hmm. But they've failed. It's the same old snake oil. Smell the coffee, get on with it. Actually give the invest, invest in the people, the appropriate people, under a film fund, they can take it forward. But don't, do not try and say that Scotland or uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh or anyone else should bend the rules the way these other people have. The model you should be looking at is not Ireland, it's Atlanta. Look at that model. That's the future. Not, put, not doing what we're doing here. And guys like Ian Smith, listen to them. They're the guys that matter. I, I, I wasn't saying that anyone was bending the rules. I mean, my, my perception of Ireland was... Did you just say that? You said that Manchester bent the rules. We need to have the Manchester members bend the rules? questioning mm -hmm. the witnesses as opposed to witnesses questioning each other. Um, <laughs> Rachel, have you finished your line of questioning? Just because we have other members keen to get in. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, I, I found this uh, session to be uh, hugely uh, fascinating, to be honest. Um, uh, and kind of thinking about the past, uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that uh, if, we just can, if we just focus on the past, then we will never progress, we'll never go forward. But it's, uh, one of the, the, the best pieces of um, evidence I think I've ever heard in any committee was from 
It's a couple of weeks ago, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, you just you, you quoted him a few moments ago as well, was, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, was it Mr. Tiernan. Uh, he mentioned that uh, in terms of the film industry, we should consider it to be like the shipbuilding industry. Instead of launching a ship, you're launching a film. I think if we can get to having that type of understanding uh, of the sector, uh, then we will actually have a better sector and a, a better product going forward, and we will uh, then encourage more people to come and film in this area. Digital media, it's not just film and TV production. Digital media is what these facilities will, uh, will induce all of these sorts of businesses. Mm. don't know if anyone else wants to... If you're using that analogy, um, you know, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, it's it's not just about having the spaces in, in the analogy of shipbuilding. You don't just have the building where you build the ship and expect people to come to you. It's about having the right staff that are trained in the right ways to, to build world-class products. And in the same way, in, in that example, you know, that's what it's all about for us here as well, is we need um, world-class crew and we need to have enough opportunity here that they're going to stay and live and work here because what we see more and more often is that unfortunately we have highly talented crew but they don't have the level of work here the volume of work here to um, enable them to live and work in Scotland and I know many many people who are currently working down in London in all corners of the world that would love to come back and live and work in Scotland if we had the industry there that they feel that they need and I think that we can't just look at it in terms of having these studio spaces as brilliant as they are. What the screen unit really needs to look at is the facilities that come along with studios, creating world-class facilities, post-production facilities, um, facility companies, and we also need the training programmes, um, you know, in the same way that productions like Outlander have done. Obviously, the National Film and Television School is a, is a great addition to the Scottish landscape. Um, we need more like that to bring people up through the industry so that we can sit here in 15, 20 years' time with a bank of productions under our belt, Indigenous and international, um, with highly trained crew that are, are making a living here and and launching those films out into the world, as you say. Jim, I mean, that industrial process that Tommy was talking about, I think Jim's project will, will certainly meet that remit. That, that's where your, your high-end projects yeah. will go. But, you know, e even just, you know, what we do at Film City is our refurbished old town hall, but in the last six months, we've done a three million budget film and uh, a CBB show and an a upcoming BBC children's show all modest <laughs> set builds. So at that lower end of the market, you need fit for purpose space, because you, you all visited, you know, we made things happen there, but it's not really fit for purpose. So that, that term of ladder of accommodation is really what, th through the high end stuff, through the refurb stuff, is what we really need in Scotland to, to create that ladder of accommodation. And by having a, a well-resourced film fund that can go and, and do this, that can actually bring on, bring on the Scottish talent, Bring on the writers, the storytellers, the producers. That's where the investment should be. Um, yeah, at, at the moment, the, the film and TV sector in Scotland is, is um, it's hit and miss, really. We've done very well with Outlander. Um, last year, we had a terrific year in the Edinburgh city region with um, Avengers Infinity War for seven weeks of filming, which t took over Palamis building to do their builds in, um, and, but filmed largely, well, on the streets, as I'm sure you were all aware, with the yeah. various traffic management um, regulations we brought in. Um, we also had Mary Queen of Scots, um, and uh, we brought in £16 million of investment into the city region through having these productions, which were not based in Scotland. They came in, they shot what they needed on, the loca on locations, they hired some local crew, they used our hotels, um, and then they went away again, uh, not leaving a legacy, which we would have liked, because, because we didn't have the tools. You know, having, having more studios in Scotland is like having... It's, it's, it, it's, the, um, it's the knives and the cutlery in your cutlery drawer. It's, it's, it's what we need to, to create content regularly, to give people regular work here. Um, but this, look at the, the fact that, what was it, 170 million came to Scotland? Could have been 450 to 500 million. Why? Because it didn't have the facilities. Now it's going to have the facilities. That's a foregone conclusion. These studios, the Earth Studio, and the other renovations and the, the other will happen. It's how it's going to be sustained. 
that is more important. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that notion of industry and the shipbuilding, and I think you know, and, and launching a film. And I don't want to make it too simplistic, but you know, it, it is this issue of of do we want an industry, and do or or do we want this kind of how, how the, the way Scotland has been before, which is struggling against everything from from talent, uh, the loss of talent to. Uh, that everything, all these productions being dragged to London. And if we want that industry, it, it is inevitably, it is, it, it has many facets to it and it requires lots of different aspects to grow it. But, and I think, again, what Tim and the research that everybody's put into here has shown the value of it. And I, and I feel that, that, that that task about building an industry in the film unit is, is perhaps hitting the right note. It, it, it's, as I say, it's not, we know it's not about the boxes. We've said all that. It is, it, is, it is about what is our desire to build this industry and how do we do that? And, you know, the industry itself will grow it. We will grow it if, if you guys, if whether, you know, whoever it may be, if the government agencies, if government itself will make a choice to say, this industry is worth supporting. Because the ship when he's gone, we know all that nonsense. All that's gone. We know all that. It's now about saying, what, what, how do we want this industry to grow? Now's the time to do it. It's, it, it's let, and let's find a way. Find a way to get around state aid restrictions. Find a round, way to, around to get around the London centricity of it. Find a way to get around the, the, the crew aspect of it. And work on those things. But if we pursue this notion of a box, We'll be, we will be sitting here, Tony Act, because uh, there's too many different voices, too many different qualifications. We've shown it. We've seen it. I think build, the, build the industry. It certainly does start with the studio, and I know watching some previous sessions, Tommy Gormley put it really well when he said in the same place that, you know, Parliament is a place of work and people come here and you, you come here to, to meet and talk and work. That's what a studio effectively is for people that work in the film industry. You need a, you need a, a, a starting place. But then we it's everything that comes... We need projects. We, 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 exactly we need projects. Of, you know, the building will fine. The issue is getting the business into the country. But if you don't have that in the first place, it's saying if there's no space where productions can actually base, what you're getting at the moment is productions that are coming up here and actually, you know, for maybe a month, up to maybe four, five, six months at a time, doing everything else that they need to do in London or other parts of the world where there are studio spaces, where they have this place of work, then they're coming up here for the essential locations that they can't cheat anywhere else if you like that you know you can't cheat Edinburgh anywhere else you can't cheat the Kerrang anywhere else Glencoe they're coming up here to get those bits and then they're leaving again and that's what's not leaving a legacy here and because there's no studio they're not basing here then crew aren't being trained up um, facilities companies aren't developing post-production houses aren't developing it's it's sort of stagnant and I think that's that's what we need to really focus on is all the other elements said that if he calls up in Scotland and says, I want to produce a film in Scotland, uh, who does he call? Now, that question was not answered. When he calls up, he gets referred to three or four different people, and there are different, uh, four different departments, all of whom have no authority. So that's the first thing. Get the right people in place, and the right people under a focused screen or a media sector within, if it's going to be within Creative Scotland. So it's a root and branch change that's got to happen. You've got to get the right people. You've got to give them the tools. You've got to give them the incentive. You've got to give them the targets. And you've got to give them the support that they need to perpetuate the business. The facilities are only a small part of that. Actually, in terms of a supplementary, the Screen Unit is obviously bringing people from Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise and other agencies together. And one of the focuses of our inquiries is to judge whether that screen unit will work cohesively together. And just if, if I could go to Film City's submission, which I thought uh, hit the nail on the head when they talked about Creative Scotland do not currently manage or administer large scale capital funds. So other than advocacy and lobbying are limited on this issue. Equally, Scottish Enterprise are not tasked with investing speculatively in businesses that do not meet their growth criteria. And I just wondered, uh, but specifically, Tiernan, you know, like, do you think that the Screen Unit will overcome those historical problems with those two key agencies? Well, I mean, I mean Brodie, who's the head of the Screen Commission, is like busting a gut to try and, you know, find a way forward to, you know, make this happen. So you, you have to empower those staff with, with decision-making powers to say, we think this will work. We've done all... We've done all 
We've done the business plan. We've done the, you know, who, who's, be, who's better placed? Than when someone wants to film in Scotland, Brodie will probably be the first person they call and say, what have you got? So who's better placed to be right at the heart of decision making about, you know, what kind of funding that they need to make a studio happen? If it was, if it was, if I was in government and we could get away around the state aid issues, I would say, there's 10 million pounds You've identified the site we could re refurbish. Let's, let's just get on and do it. But you're involve going back to handouts again. You're going back to the. You're going back to where the public is paying for the tools and the toys for the perpetuation of the industry. The industry should be paying for it. Well, that well, that's where I feel. That's that. That's exactly. A, a so what your your yeah. your, mm -hmm. your approach is sponsor us and we'll do well. Just do well. There's the, but the, there's, but it's a clean. It. But it's a clean deal. I mean, the, what's a clean deal? They give the money to develop to develop out a building, then they use the profits from that building to create even more stuff. They How do you guarantee it and underwrite it? Hmm? That's the problem. Scottish Enterprise would love to do that, mm -hmm. but how do you prove the criterion that they have to, as the uh, the guardians of the public purse, mm -hmm. to say that there's going to be a guaranteed return? There isn't a guaranteed return. Yes, but, but therefore it's too. It is too. Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not predictable enough. Well, it's too mercurial. So you have to change the model. Don't keep trying to reproduce what that's been produced in the past. But I mean, I would argue that GV and economic impact are, for, for are more than maybe more important than a financial return on a, a straight-head property. Once there's a studio there, there'll be a call. Kelly has what? to say. Yeah, I, I would argue that the, the GVA and economic impact of a, of a facility like that is more important than economic return. You know, so, so, so I would invest it in that basis. This, this is what. This is what the industry, you know, the industry have supported uh, your proposal, but the industry in Scotland are, are crying out for a facility to be built and for the Scottish Government or the local authority to intervene and get, get on and, and build this. And what they've done, you know, again, back to Manchester, you look at Manchester in terms of a, a business case, they've just built a brand new 30,000 square foot studio right next door. Stage. stage sorry, OK, stage. There is a 17,000 square foot unit just been acquired by a camera company moving in on site. There'll be other creative companies moving in on site. So the case is there, an extrapolation of what we do in day at Film City. You've got a, a modest studio space, but what's really creating the sort of income is all the creative tenants around it. Michael Grade said about Pinewood, he said, what defines Pinewood is our media hub. There are over 200 tenants there that are creating a huge amount of income. So. In my opinion, I don't think you'll get that, Pentland. I don't think you'll get these big uh, commercial units uh, occupied by supply companies. You won't get production companies going there because it's where it is. But if you base that in Glasgow or Edinburgh, your bread and butter business model is all those creative tenants creating income. So if there is a cyclical demand in the studio space, it doesn't really matter. Glasgow Hi, doesn't did you have a, have a supplementary? Uh, just some questions on state aids. Right, no, I'm going to go. You've already had an opportunity to question the witnesses, so I'm going to go to Mary Gujan. Uh, thank you, convener. It was really just to go back to um, really questions about training, and uh, that's what I was interested in reading about some of the evidence and the written submissions that you'd put forward to the committee. Uh, it was really just about some of the... I suppose the general education or the general courses that people could go, can go into, but the lack of training for very specific roles within the area. And it was really just to, to tease that out a bit more. I mean, do you th would you say that it's fair to say, is it fair to say that I suppose there's a, probably a general lack of awareness as to the the wide variety of roles that can sometimes be available in the, in, in the industry? Uh, do you also know what the... Can you tell us a bit more about what the relationship is like between industry and education as well? Is there feedback either way as to if there's a specific need for specific roles, how that ties in? Are we making sure that we're getting people into the correct training for that so that our training is modified to allow us to produce what we need? Starting the process, I think there's still a long way to go. I mean, our experience is that we, 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 we are now working with other training bodies that exist within the industry with in a more specific and targeted way. And we look at our own workforce and say, well, what are our missing elements of it? And we try and feed those, feed those areas. I'm not sure that there's the link between education and the industry is well enough developed yet. I think, I think that can still 
still going on, but uh, you, you know, news like the, 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 the National Film School standing up in Scotland, and all those things help. Um, and, and I think now it is getting targeted, but it needs to be accelerated, and, and the focus needs to be kept going on it. You know, they're, they're, because, you know, but it, and again, it is, it is scale dependent. Outland is, the f I think, the first show in Scotland, for example, where we're starting to make, for example, for what, fibrous plaster. You know, that was hardly used in Scotland before in terms of industry. So as the industry grows, demand increases into more specific and more, and if you like, more varied, disparate roles. And we're trying to see, identify those and fill them. Now, and across the, but it's the same across the industry, not just in Scotland. For example, the, the lack of accountants within the film business, film TV business in, in, in Britain is, is, is woeful. So we target it, we've just got to increase it. And again, again I think that we're going back, that, that, that screen unit has to have that under its wing as well, because I think you know, the, the one thing that is missing uh, perhaps in, in training area at the moment is, is, a, is a coherent, a more coherent uh, path for it. I think all the groups that are involved with it uh, do work well together, but I think it could just be just be pushed on more. It just, it's just growth more, 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 pushing that on a little bit more. That helps. That My experience of, sort of certainly younger people that are trying to come up through the industry is that they have perhaps um, studied film and TV, or perhaps they haven't. If they have, it's it's generally quite a broad training that they've received with quite a focus on perhaps um, directing or screenwriting which is absolutely brilliant and if, if you can make it as one of those things that's excellent but I think what we certainly miss is um, very specific training courses and as we've said the National Film and T Television School coming in I was having a look at some of their courses last night it looks like they are going to really specify introductions to certain departments which is great I know that larger productions have started sort of taking on people and, and sort of bringing them up through the ranks if you like but Certainly at the moment for us, when we are hiring and crewing up for productions, we do notice that there is a, a gap for certain um, departments, certain positions that we're looking to fill because people aren't coming up as much through the industry here as they are perhaps in other areas of the UK. And perhaps it is because there is confusion about, you know, whether you've studied film and TV or media or not, how, how, where do you begin? How do you start to get into this industry? What points of access are there for you and you know I, I do I, I don't envy people that are trying to sort of make it in the industry here and and work their place in the industry out um, I would personally welcome more um, training programs whether it is working directly on productions or more theoretical training programs that that really give people the specific training and experience of of what they need to make it in certain departments in in the industry because unfortunately although we will always try and, and hire a scottish crew first we do inevitably then have to start to look at other areas of the uk for people that we can bring in on certain productions, particularly if there are maybe one or two big features or TV drama shooting in Scotland at the same time, because then all that crew is soaked up and we're suddenly having to look elsewhere for, for other talented crew. That one thing that, that strikes me is obviously going through school and education myself, you just, and it's only really been through this inquiry and speaking to a variety of different people involved in the, in the industry, you realise the sheer scale and number of roles that are involved. And I think that's something that is, I feel that there's maybe a general lack of awareness, but I think also that what's been important about this inquiry is it puts a focus on we see how much this could be worth to Scotland and the potential that's there. And I think that there needs to be a greater awareness uh, of the value of the industry as a whole and, uh, and more importance placed on that. I, some of the... Um, yeah, the comments that you made there, Amy, did touch on uh, some of the evidence that we received from the likes of Taste Green Scotland, where they said that uh, there's that they lack, uh, you know, some very specific and uh, specialist crew like studio op studio operators, and uh, is that a skill base which needs to be brought in from from elsewhere in that case? And do you think that uh, an increase in the infrastructure, um, how can an increase in the infrastructure support that training in Scotland? Can I just, can I just oh, come yeah, back sorry. about the education aspect? Um, screen unit proposals include an additional £1 million for training. There is a question as to whether that will be enough. Um, it doesn't strike me as an awful lot. Um, there was um, an announcement yesterday by the UK government that there's another, I think it's £150 million yeah, yeah, it's exactly being invested. Outlander costs us £250,000 a year, which Outlander pays for half of that. 
or yeah. more than half of that. So, so there's further money made available yesterday, some of which was earmarked specifically for education. And I think your point about um, awareness of the a huge variety of different roles um, at a, a school level is something which is lacking. And I know it's come up in, um, I've been at events with Creative Skill Set, and they are aware of this. You know, you don't go through school thinking, oh, I want to be a, a set painter. You know, you, you don't know that these jobs exist, and yet within the film industry, it's like the army, there are, there are well, hundreds at least, of different types of very specific jobs with different kinds of skill sets. I think awareness in schools these days is still very much about, I want to be a director, or I want to be an actor, and, and that's about it. But, you know, you might be um, particularly, you, you might enjoy cooking, and, and there are jobs for you as a, <laughs> as a cook within the film industry, or perhaps you're, you're, you know, you're interested in hair and makeup, or again, you know, it's not something that I think school children are aware of, and yet there, it, it's something that really needs to be grasped. And I think Creative Skillset is beginning to look at this. Yeah, I think they are beginning it's to it. I mean, really it's, important. You know, just anecdotally, we can have out on days, we can want 60 makeup and hair artists on Outland, of which we might have to bring up half of them from, from the south of England. So. Skill, you know, just because yeah. you go and do a hair and makeup training and you maybe work in a salon, it's not the same. There are, there are very specific skill levels that are, uh, that are applied to the film industry in particular, and therefore it is something that school leavers need to be need to have in their minds as as a, as a possibility that they could go and train specifically for the film industry. So I think that's one aspect of a very broad approach if we want to grow this industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman, did you want to come back on something? Uh, I just wanted to ask a few questions about state aids. Right, OK. Um, can we go back to state aids? Because there seems to be quite a bit of confusion around all this, which is not really helping the conversation. Um, the Manchester project is run by the City Council. They are the sole shareholder. It's a municipal enterprise. Um, municipal enterprises are common. The City of Edinburgh Council runs a very successful bus um, business. The state aid... Um, um, problems that were identified by the government to the previous um, Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee back in 2016 um, were focused on two things. One, the state providing assistance to the private sector. That's not what Manchester is. And the second was where the state and the public sector invest in a project like a film studio that it should operate according to the market economy operator principle. In other words, it should be a business. Now, if the money is available, if the finance is available, if the investors are available uh, in, uh, to build a film studio, that's, that's one thing. If we want the public sector involved, it seems pretty clear that the model to adopt is a municipal enterprise, wholly, share, share, wholly owned company of City of Edinburgh Council or Glasgow City Council. It's not for the government to get involved in that. I mean, the government owns Prestwick Airport. It's a sole shareholder in Caledonia and McBrain. It's a sole shareholder in Scottish Water. But those are different beasts altogether. So would you agree that the choice really is a municipal enterprise leads on this, operates within the market, totally compliant, or it's the private sector on its own? And then we put to one side the question of whether the state provides public support to the private sector, because that's what got Valencia into problems. Well, I, 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 I was just being maybe over-optimistic that, and this has not been party political, is that the central government uh, is the SNP. The SNP are the majority in Glasgow and Edinburgh councils. You would think, you know, from an outsider's point of view, there was some sort of common sense or chain of command that could make this happen at local authority level. And that, that's just my personal view on it. You, you'd think there was maybe that joined up thinking. I'm not, I'm not here to have a go at Edinburgh City Council, Glasgow City Council. Glasgow City Council has been brilliant with Film City. Edinburgh City Council helped us a lot when we're trying to get Palamas off the ground. But times are tough. They don't have, they don't have the money, but Manchester does. That's a fact. But all, all my point of contention is that there is a way to do it. So why, are we keep, why do we keep talking about state aid? I appreciate there's a difference between government and uh, municipal level, but you would think, from an outsider's point of view, there was a conversation to be had to enable a local authority to do this. Are you not the enablers to, be, to allow this to happen? 
Is there not some ex again from an outsider's point of view? Is there not some extraordinary activity or money that you can give to a local authority to, to do that? There is there is money that government is giving specifically to local government in the city region deals. I'm not aware of any proposition through the city region deals anywhere in Scotland that involves building a film studio. Have there been conversations? Maybe it's time to have those conversations. Yeah, it's may, you know, may, maybe now and, 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 and part of the remit of this screen unit is to try and facilitate that conversation to direct it so that the local, you know, one of the city authorities can take that task. But been assisted and directed by a central body. Different cities have different priorities. I mean, Manchester's obviously got this real focus on you know, the huge legacy of Manchester and the, the creative industries. You know, that, that's, that's its focus. Other, other local authorities might have different fo focuses on, for whatever reason. I'd, I, I would imagine, from, from our dealings with Edinburgh and Palamas, I know I didn't get the impression they had that sort of money to, to spend on this type of project. And Glasgow, you know, they've invested in Film City, but they had the Commonwealth Games, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't believe that they, they would have that kind of money either. My view is that they should be investing in the production companies and the product, not the facilities. The facilities do not merit state aid. What merits state aid is the product. That's what's needed. There is no state aid in the Manchester project, no. as far as I'm aware. It's a business. It's run as a business that Manchester have decided to invest in. So what of Edinburgh or Glasgow? They've decided not to. So you're, move on. Yeah, so you're right, Andy. Yeah, there, there's no state. They've taken a decision as in a local authority to do that. My comment was, it, it, it's, it's just baffling that a, a, a government in power can't influence a local authority of the same party to make something happen. That's, that's my outsider's point of view. Whether there's a, the process to do that or not is another thing, but as a citizen of Scotland, I find that baffling. Yeah, I mean, go local government is, a, is autonomous. It makes its own decisions. There may be commonalities in the parties in control, and that's up to those parties what they do. As, uh, and this comes up with, with the screen unit and the, the um, screen set to leadership group um, uh, requirements that data is, a, is really key here. I think, you know, the local authorities, I know Edinburgh was looking at, you know, whether or not they could, whether they could take the risk and run a film studio, but the data wasn't sufficient to, it, they just didn't have the data and for the council is not, they're not property developers, they're not film studio operators. Um, so the call for accurate data um, and the numbers that demonstrate exactly what's going to come back from investing over a 10 year period or longer, you know, it was lacking. We haven't got this infrastructure in Scotland other than Ward Park. Um, Could I just challenge the idea that the city's not up? I'm going to have to stop you there. You've had quite a bit of time already. Um, can I ask members, I know we've gone over time with the witnesses. Have you got another 10 minutes or? You all OK? Right. Mr McMillan, did you have another question that you wanted to ask on this subject? Uh, yes. Um, it's not on Mr Whiteman's area, but just one other question. OK, thank you. Um, it's just <clears throat> one of the things that's uh, struck me uh, undertaking uh, this piece of uh, work in this committee uh, has been the, the level of um, engagement that people outside of Parliament uh, have actually taken uh, in this. Uh, but that, I'm not talking about uh, people involved in the industry, but actually uh, normal members of the public. Uh, and I think going back to you know, where we've been over the course of the last 15, 20 years uh, and beyond, having this discussion about what type of sector should we have, it, does, uh, does the panel think that, uh, that the wider uh, public, the, the wider uh, members of the public, the general public, are actually uh, more... Uh, understanding now in terms of what this particular sector could actually bring to the economy in terms of jobs, in terms of opportunities, uh, as compared to any other time uh, beforehand. Again, going back to the, you know, on the outland effect, I would say yes. I mean, it, when, when our landlord receives the letters from local people in Cumbernauld saying, thank you for what you've done with that building, you've turned this crumbling old shed that sit there empty into this building which we can be proud of, I think we are seeing that shift. And again, when Outlander now rolls into town with its inordinately large circus, 
um, we are welcome. People see the business opportunity that we bring. We, can, we, we do change. We have clearly had impact on various communities where suddenly business have grown up in our way. Uh, not least our impact on, on, uh, on, uh, on the National Trust properties and historic Scotland properties. So I, I, I'm aware of it. I think, I think that within that kind of social media drive now, people become more possessive of the shows they like. So they begin to think that they own them. That creates a slightly different issue, um, but we won't go into now. But I, I, I'm aware of that very much so. I think there's a lot more pride taken in the fact that Outland, for example, is, is made in Scotland. Just looking at another example, um, there's a, a show called Nashville, which was made in Tennessee a few years ago, where they have a studio, obviously. Um, they uh, reported, you know, that they quantified the impact that it has there. Nashville has a state sales tax as well as a county sales tax, and they can see the amount of money that's been returned to the state as a result of film tourists from the success of that series. So, um, for instance, they made... Um, uh, $63 million worth of state sales tax from Nashville Motivated Tourists, or NMT, as they are referred to. Um, $20 million of county sales tax revenue from Nashville Motivated Tourists, and $1.2 million worth of state, state sales tax from international travels travellers who went to Tennessee having seen the show. And this all comes through beds, hotel beds, um, from restaurants uh, because there's tax on everything so they can see exactly how much is coming back in in a, in a financial capacity from visitors who have gone to that place as a result of a hit series. Um, we don't have the financial figures for the tourist impact from Outlander. We have, we have um, numbers of, of visitors. We, we know that numbers to Dune Castle has gone up 110% in the four years since the yeah. series came out. Walking down the high street this morning. Yeah. I mean, what do we see? Every tour has an Outlander tour. Absolutely. No, I know that's, well, we're talking slightly against you there, uh, Stuart, because I think you were talking about a national pride and a national association with, or, or a more public association with the industry. And I do think, I think that is, uh, is great. It, it's an anecdotal one. I think Rosie, Rosie gives us the, the factual ones, but uh, it's hard to put a number on that, but it, I, we feel it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, the the creative industry is the fastest growing sector in the UK economy. That's, that's a fact. You know, I, can, I can back that data up. So there's still a bit of work to do in terms of, you know, when you ask a parent in terms of what their child will do, it'll be doctor, lawyer, STEM, and what we let's enter the creative indus industries because it's quite a nebulous concept, but it is the fastest growing sector. Film and TV, as I've said, drives a lot of that activity. So in Scotland, projects like Outlander, Jim's project will hopefully put that at the, at the front face f f in terms of the public's perception of it and what Rosie said about it being a viable career as well. I think a lot of people now do see the, the positive impact of filming and, you know, you, you can look at, um, you know, the various tourist attractions, as they say, and the, the local communities that in a way have been transformed positively by filming and although for us as an organization and, and me as an individual we don't obviously shoot on the scale of Outlander we work in advertising but we're lucky to shoot across all corners of Scotland and transform these communities for maybe a week two weeks perhaps and we are hiring locally where we can we're hiring local accommodation we're using local services like caterers for example we're my casting locally we are really engaging with that local community and we never maybe we're very fortunate but we've never had a, a wholly negative experience of that and I think for us a huge um, benefit and um, something that really enables us to work in those communities very well is our relationships with the local and regional film offices um, obviously we have Creative Scotland we don't largely deal with them as an organization because we're already here and we kind of know roughly what we're doing but where we find a huge benefit is working with regional film offices like Rosie at Film Edinburgh um, across the country they really do uh, help us when we're working out how to shoot in these maybe potentially quite challenging areas these areas that maybe we don't know so well um, and I think that from my point of view they should be given all the tools and the funding that they need to to carry on doing a, a great job with that because it really does make the difference when you are essentially coming into a, a small community to do something that's a little alien to them that they they don't quite know about but we're very fortunate that we we do have positive experiences with the people that we meet point that it's not solely uh, Edinburgh or Glasgow.
cut you off because we've got some other, other members uh, that want to come in. Mm. Uh, Claire Baker. Oh, thank you, convener. I think we've had a useful discussion around the need for our skills, infrastructure, all the things that we can uh, provide in Scotland. But I wanted to ask how important the money is. And Jim said there shouldn't be government involvement, but the UK government does give a 25% film tax relief as an incentive for companies to come here. And I know Budapest has been mentioned. Um, I'm assuming people go to Budapest rather than here because it's about how much it costs. So how, how important are those... Is, is really, you know, I think we're, we're arguing about whether they come to Scotland because we, it's to do with infrastructure, the skills of what we have. Is it not actually just all about the money? It's because it's cheaper here. Because producers is what's the tax incentive in any country, and how do we get it? Is it cash? Is it credit? How does it work? You know, what do we need to qualify? That's just the way the game works anywhere in the world now. Any studio, any business, that's what we ask. Mm -hmm. The success of the UK industry is fundamental. It's fundamentally based on the value of the tax credit and how successful it's been. And that it, it outstretches everybody else. The the you know the other hubs in Europe, whether it be Prague or, or Budapest, uh, are, are also about that tax credit coupled with you know local facilities and and local costs there. And Budapest's success in comparison to say Prague was because Prague got on the train later. They got on the train later. They had a wonderful industry. Their tax incentive wasn't put in place. Their, their government wouldn't do it for many years. And Budapest pushed ahead, forged ahead, built more studios, increased their crew, increased their business excrementally. And, and Prague is only now catching up. So, I mean, you're right. The, the, that, that element is significant. And then once we peel that back as producers, we then go, what's next? Do we want to be there as, as in terms of our locations? What's our crew base? What are our facilities? What help are we getting? You know, it, which, which country is putting its hand up? Or which region is putting its hand up saying, me, me, me? I've got that extra little bit that can, that can sell it to you once you've ticked those other boxes. You have, sorry. No, go ahead, Rosie. Um, the value of inward investment film, um, film production in the UK grew 23% last year on 2016. And for high-end TV, the inward investment value grew 27%. In total, um, the UK calculated £2.6 billion worth of spend from film and TV production in the UK. That's, it's, it's an enormous amount of money. Um, £2.4 billion pounds worth of that. Yeah, more of it. It's it's just, we just, we just got to get more of it. it just, we need it. We deserve it. But, you know, let's find a way. One thing there, if I may, which is that obviously, again, I work in the advertising industry. Tax incentives don't apply to advertising. Um, for us, we are often in competition with a lot of other particularly European countries, a lot of Eastern European countries, people are making a decision about whether to come and bring the business to us in Scotland or whether to go and shoot in multiple other countries in Europe. So for us, um, although obviously tax incentives is a huge part of it, if we can have crew incentives, that's another huge part of it, incentivise the use of local crew. But for us personally, um, we do often... You know, the things that we're looking at is that those countries maybe do have studio spaces. We don't. We can show them warehouses that are fine, um, but they're not a purpose-built studio with all the home comforts that they um, they bring with them. Um, we're also looking at local crew. Obviously, we can't compete cost-wise with Eastern Europe. We know that. There's nothing we can do about that. So for us, we're trying to prove ways that people would want to come and shoot in Scotland. It's the, the talent of our local crew, our amazing locations, but other European countries are, are wising up to that. You know, the more productions they have in there, the more highly trained their, their crew are becoming. Um, they're really looking at the locations that they can offer and diversifying what they can offer there. And that's something that we, as a company, really try and stay on the, the top of our game with. Um, so for us, all of those other, obviously cost is, is king, but all of those other elements are really important as well to try and justify why people want to come and bring their business to us in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Mr O'Donnell mentioned uh, Georgia, um, which obviously has tax incentives, but our tax incentives apply across the UK, of, of course. Uh, is there anything else specific about Georgia that we should be emulating? <clears throat> they started from scratch. They started even further behind the Scotland. It had nothing. Georgia was... Um, it's not the best place to film, if you speak to the people there. Relative humidity is very high. The costs are very high. Um, but what they have is they welcomed the production people to come. They offered the incentives. I think Tommy Gormley had said that 
at the present time, if the Scottish Government decided to drop the tax or improve the taxation... They don't have control over tax. But eventually, as Tommy had said, this is where the, the eventuality of having your own industry. But if they could, then by changing that, that's one way to make it more attractive. My experience is, and as I say, I, I'm guarded in this because I'm here as a property developer, but my experience is, is that the guys that make, and women that make decisions to come to any country are stimulated by the bottom line. They will make do with facilities. They will make do with local areas if the bottom line is attractive enough to them. So therefore, my view is government should make it attractive for them. Make it, the incentives should all be through. And if I, if I can say, I didn't say that there shouldn't be state aid. I, what I said is there shouldn't be state aid in the property side unless it's a gap. But what there should be is that, I'll go back on it, put a, a sizable film fund together behind the people that can work it to incentivise the productions to come here. It's a terrible statement. Build it and they will come. It's the old, you know, anecdote that comes through the movies. But it's going to be built anyway. Move on for that. Actually attract the folk to come and use it now. And more importantly, to keep coming back using it and to do pre- and post-production. Not just to come here, do what they have to do, and then they'll go back. I mean, Rosie had mentioned the Avenger movies. Go back into the films, and all you would see is pine wood along every vehicle and every sign and everything else that was there. It was all pine wood. Where was there something for the Scottish companies? It was very, very small percentage of crew were hired. They were all brought from the Golden Triangle and brought up here. To me, that's where the difference should be. Well, can I thank you all very much for your time today and also for going over time. We appreciate you're very busy people, so we do appreciate you coming and giving evidence today. Um, we'll now suspend this meeting and go into private session.